Okay, folks, so you know all this uh, stuff here is a scam. There's lots of scams. The global warming is another scam. <clears throat> the truth is, with all of the rural and uh, geodetic temperature and, and weather monitoring stations around the world, if you take all the data from all of those and put it together, the truth is the temperature is actually getting a little cooler, not warmer. How do they perpetrate this global warming hoax? It's very simple. They take the temperature readings where the temperature is affected by some outside source, such as in the middle of a city. Right. They just change the place where they're taking the temperature so that the temperature is affected by something else. Artificial, usually man-created, like parking lots. Where is the temperature greater? In the park or in the parking lot? In the parking lot. Now, I want to uh, go a long way back into history now, because I'm going to start with a few things that you need to know. And it's going to explain a few things that you've been seeing. And then we'll come up to modern time. And then the last couple of hours are going to be spent on what's going on and what you can do about it. OK? But first, we have to understand history. We've got to. If we don't understand history, if we don't understand symbology, if we don't understand race and religion, you cannot possibly understand what's happening today or why, who's bringing it about, and what you can do to combat it. It's absolutely impossible. And a lot of people think they can, but they can't. And I'll give you an example of how you can't. Isn't it true that most Americans have been spending a lot of time for a lot of years trying to figure out who in the hell is destroying this country? Haven't they? Well, if you've been spending all that time, what's your answer? Logically, from what you yourself have discovered, not what I've told you up here. The answer is you still don't know, right? Isn't that correct? You look around for the enemy and you can't find the enemy. It's because you haven't looked in the mirror. And that's the truth. You've looked everywhere, except right here. <clears throat> I've searched my entire life to find the devil, and I finally found him. You know where he is? Right here. And I can let him take over, or I can cast him out. But he doesn't exist anywhere else. Don't believe me? Take all human beings out of a complete area and see what happens to that area. And this had nothing to do with the environment, the atmosphere, or anything else. I'm not an environmental freak. What happens? God's plan takes hold. The laws of nature rule. Everything functions as it should, and there is no evil anywhere. Now that ought to tell you that evil exists in the hearts and minds of man. That's where you're going to find the devil. If there is one, he's in us. If you don't believe that, try that little experiment. Just try it. Evil exists only where man exists. Okay? Is there evil on the sun? No. <laughs> Why not? No, there's no men on the sun. There's no men on the sun. We're not there. The only place you'll find evil is where you find a man or a woman. And the more men and women you find, the more evil you're going to find there exists within us. Why does it exist within us? 
Well, we're going to find out some of it. And we're going to find out why certain things are happening. Okay? If we go back as far back into history as we can possibly go, and if we can imagine, no matter what you believe, okay, because what I'm going to recount to you now is the official hidden version of mankind that is taught in the mysteries. It's not what I believe. It doesn't have to be. And it doesn't matter whether it's what I believe or what you believe or what anybody else believes. What matters, folks, is that these people are running things. And if they're running things, what they believe will affect us and we better know what the hell that is. Because that's what's driving them. Drives them. Whatever's driving them that's going to affect us, we have to understand to be able to combat it. A general that goes upon a battlefield without a knowledge of his opponent enemy commander, his, uh, his abilities, his tactics, his forces, the weapons at his disposal, and the morale of his men, is most probably going to lose that battle. Those of you who have been in responsible positions in the military, you understand that. Here's their version of history. And like I said, it doesn't matter whether you agree with it, believe in it, or not. It's what they believe. It's what's driving things today. And you better understand it. They believe that way back at the dawn of the history of the human race, there was a golden age. How many of you have heard that? The golden age. So many people read about it in their writings and don't understand what it is and don't even ask a question. They just take it for granted. I did that for years. Golden age. Oh, that's nice. Keep reading, thinking that I understood what I was reading. I didn't understand what I was reading until I figured out what they're talking about. The golden age was the age of innocence in man evolution. This is their story, remember, so don't get upset if you believe a different one. Man could not think. It was an animal. It was innocent. Innocent. He went about his business living according to the laws of nature with the other beasts and animals and plants on this earth. What does religion call it? Garden of Eden. Religion says it's the Garden of Eden. God made Adam and Eve, put them in the garden to take care of the garden. They lived in innocence alongside the beasts of the field and the lions and tigers and the plants and the trees. Back during that time, man was, they say, vegetarian. Ate roots and plants and nuts and berries just like many of the animals did. Man lived in harmony with nature. At some point during that time, some man had an original thought. What is that called in religion? Original sin. Man wasn't supposed to think. <laughs> okay, this is what they say. Had an original thought. And with that original thought, he picked something up and he used to kill that animal. Bonk! You're eating the root that I was going to eat. Bonk! And he killed it. And it was dead. He decided to take a bite and see what it tastes like. It tasted good, so he became a meat eater. And a tuber eater. And a berry eater. And a nut eater. And vegetable eater. And somewhere along the line, man had learned to use this club. The man that could use the club was more powerful than other men. Just like today, folks, there are people who seem to catch on quicker than others. Doesn't mean the ones who haven't caught on yet are stupid, or they don't have a brain, or they're worthless. It just means they haven't caught on yet. 
And so the guy that had the club became the king. I'm the king because if you mess with me, I'll hit you with my club. You haven't learned how to pick up a piece of wood and hit me with it yet. So I am your master. That worked until other men watching him learned how to pick up a piece of wood and said, uh-uh, you ain't the king, I'm the king. Well, we the king. Let's all be king. And then men had to be wary of each other. That was the consequence of that. Men then had to be wary of each other. Then came a day when, lo and behold, fire fell from heaven. A streak of light came out of the sky and struck a tree and caught it on fire. And that tree was burning. Wow. Now you'll never understand the significance of that until you understand the significance of this. Back in those times, according to the mystery schools, man was pretty much helpless. And man, unlike the animals, didn't have this big coat of wool. May have had some hair, more than we do now. But he didn't have this big woolly coat. He lived mostly in the tropics. If he went too far out of the tropics, he would die because he didn't have the means to protect himself from the cold. Man understood instinctively that the sun provided the conditions for life on earth. How did he know that? Because when the sun rose in the morning, he was damn thankful to see it, wasn't he? It was warm. And it lit up the earth, and he could see. He could see what he was doing. He could see dangerous animals coming from sometimes miles away. And he instinctively knew that the sun was giving of itself for him and for the plants and the other animals on the earth to live. And in giving of itself, it would all of a sudden sink down and disappear and die. Man lamented that passing. He would spend the night huddled in fear, praying that the sun would come back and save him from the darkness. So the sun became the savior of man as it rose every morning and died every night. Man learned to confront the prince of darkness and a battle raged between the forces of light and the forces of darkness every 24 hours. That was the beginning of the first religion according to the mysteries. And the first man who learned to predict what happened in the heavens became the first priest. And the priest was the one who sat the first king on the first throne. By using what? The gift that Prometheus brought to man. Who said that? I heard the word. What is it? Fire. Prometheus is another word for what? Lucifer. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? Lucifer was what? The great angel of light. In the mysteries, they believe that the story of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden is a metaphor for the evolution of mankind. Now remember, this is what they believe. That man was being held prisoner in the bonds, the chains of ignorance in the Garden of Eden by an unjust and vindictive and terrible God. He was set free by Lucifer through his agent Satan with the gift of intellect, which was brought to man with fire. The story of Prometheus bringing the gift of fire from heaven to mankind is a story of Satan enticing Eve and then Adam through Eve to eat of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. In other words, they believe that the great fall of man was not a fall at all. 
but was a tremendous gift from Lucifer, who is their God. What does Lucifer represent? The intellect, knowledge. Some man went to that tree when it was burning after it was struck by that lightning, after Lucifer was flung out of heaven by God. In Greek, he was called Prometheus, gave the gift of fire to man. Fire has ever since been the symbol of learning, knowledge, intellect. Why do you think every great book of learning has inside the front cover a lamp with a flame or a torch? Why do you think after they killed him, they put an eternal flame on the grave of John F. Kennedy? It represents the conquering of nature and the universe by the mind, the intellect of man. It represents the apotheosis of humanity, the perfection of the race which they seek. Deep stuff, huh? It is deep stuff, but you have to understand it in order to be able to combat it or to be able to work it to your will instead of being worked to their will. Whoever picked a burning branch up from that burning tree and learned to keep it alive became the ruler of his universe. Fire can only come from God. God lived in fire. Fire was God. Fire represented the ability to think. Fire represented the intellect. Why do you think every major religion in the world, bar none, up to a certain point in history, kept a fire burning on the altar which was never allowed to go out? It was the representation of the sun. All life, all energy, everything flowed from the sun. Sun was the representation of the power of God in the priesthood to the common profane humanity. The sun was God and was worshipped by almost every tribe and nation and people upon the face of this earth. It's important that you understand this because you're going to see the symbology everywhere. How many of you have really been to Dealey Plaza? What did you see there? Uh, at the time we were there, we didn't know the look for the things that we do now. You didn't see anything, did you? No. People go there every day, they don't see anything. <clears throat> How many of you knew that the ancient pyramids were never burial chambers. Never. Okay, some of you are up to date. Most of you aren't, though. Most of you don't know this. They were not burial chambers. They were temples of initiation in which the candidate was placed in the sarcophagus, suffered a mystical or symbolic death, lay three days in the coffin, alone, and then was raised by the grip of the lion's paw, given a new name, and sent through the initiation in the passageways of the pyramid. How many of you knew that the sum total of all of the knowledge of the primitive peoples was built into the pyramids to be passed on to the initiates? The mysteries are old. Freemasonry is old. Rosicrucianism is old. Ancient. It began when the first man picked up a branch burning and learned how to keep it alight. And he learned by hiding the method by which he maintained the fire and by telling the common man that God dwelt within the fire and by learning to predict the movements of the heavens, he could control all of the people in the realm that he could communicate to. And he became the first priest. The priests have seldom been kings, but the priests have always been be the power behind the kings. 
Without the okay of the priests, the king cannot mount the throne. Or could not in those days. Okay? So they learned several things. <clears throat> they learned that by being able to predict the natural events in the heavens, to be able to keep a fire burning on the altar, and to be able to start a fire from nothing and not be able not teach that to anybody else, they could control large numbers of people who in those days thought that that was magical. And then their lives depend upon knowing when to plant the corn and when to harvest, when to till the ground and all of those things. These are the things that the priests learned to teach them. And of course, if they made a wrong guess or a wrong prediction, what was it? We've done something to displease God. Therefore, we must make a sacrifice. Right? You're it. For some reason, they were partial to virgins. In South America, it was whoever the captives were. And they would create wars just to get captives so that they could have sacrifices to appease the gods. All throughout the history of the world, these people have been the ones who have hoarded, collected and hoarded the sum total of the knowledge of humankind. They call themselves the illumined ones, and in those days they were truly illumined, enlightened. They're the only ones who had the knowledge. The rest of the people were deprived. Over long periods of time, some knowledge would either leak out to the people or the people would make discoveries or would have original thoughts of their own and pass it on. So as man became more educated, the machinations of the Illuminati became more complicated and more clever. And the more they had to really hoard and guard the technology and the knowledge and the, and the, and the, uh, the truth that they held. They called what they knew the esoteric and what you know are the profane the exoteric. In other words, the esoteric is the inward truth, that which is withheld, that which is guarded, not known by what they call the masses. The exoteric is the outward form that they throw to the people, the metaphors that they tell. One of the ways they put it that I wrote in my book is that they speak directly to God while the people bow down to stone ta statues which can neither hear nor speak. Now it doesn't mean they're really speaking to God. This is a metaphor, remember. What it means is they're really communicating the truth. This is what they believe. It doesn't matter what we believe in their world. And if they're controlling us, we have to understand what it is that they believe and why. You see, they believe that through the use of the intellect, man himself will conquer nature. And what happens when you conquer nature? You're God. Isn't that true? They believe through the use of science and the intellect of man, man will conquer nature and the universe, and man will be God. Now, does that ring true according to religion? Of course it does. Isn't that the promise of Satan to Eve in the Garden of Eden? God lied to you. He lied to you. He's withholding your true nature. You see, he doesn't want you to eat of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, because if you do, ye will surely become as gods, and ye will not surely die. Isn't that what he said? So aren't the mysteries saying the same thing? Only they're reversing the benevolence and malevolence of the two? In traditional religion, you say that the God of the Garden of Eden 
who put Adam and Eve there was a benevolent, good God, and they were living the good life. And if they hadn't have sinned, they'd still be there living and taking care of the animals in the garden and be living a blissful, wonderful existence. And they're saying, hey, that guy that put them there and kept them in the bonds of ignorance wasn't doing them a favor. They were really slaves in this, this ignorant state, this innocent life, this golden age. Lucifer set man free, gave him the gift of intellect, the use of which will make him God. Now, it would amaze you to know how many people really believe in this. It would absolutely amaze you to know that some of the major religions in the world disguised as Christian religions actually worship Lucifer in secret. You would be amazed to know how many people believe that Jesus Christ and Lucifer were brothers. And that there was a battle between who was going to save mankind from itself. Jesus won that battle. He had his chance. He failed. Now it's Lucifer's turn. You might also be shocked to know that Tom Valentine believes that. And he said it in an interview with Richard Noon, and is recorded in his book, 5-5-2000. What's the name of that book? Ice, The Ultimate Disaster, 5-5-2000. Get it and read it. It would amaze you to know how many supposed patriot leaders that you all look up to believe this that are really not patriot leaders or, at all, but are functioning in the Hegelian dialectic to move you in the wrong direction, or to pit you against each other, or to just find out who in the hell you are. There's one that's traveled all over the whole country. And wherever he is, he is the religion of whoever he's talking to. It's true. And some of you know that. When he's talking to Christians, he's a Christian. When he's talking to Christian identity, he's a Christian identity. If he's talking to Nazis, he's a Nazi. You talking about Bobo? If he's talking to Mormons, he's a Mormon. If he's talking to people who hate Mormons, he's left the Mormon church. If he's talking to the New Agers in Sedona, Arizona, he's tried every religion in the world and he's never found one that he could believe in. That's Bo Greitz. Don't believe me? Go get all his tapes talking to all these different groups and listen to his own words. Now, I don't care what religion the man is. I believe in freedom. You know what I care about? He's lying to a lot of people. That matters to me. Some people tell me, well, I, that doesn't matter. He's doing good. I mean, you know, maybe he has some failings. Every time he speaks to a different group, and every time he gets caught, he says he's never going to do it again, but he does. And just recently on his radio show, this man was talking about how he put his son through past life regression and how he believed in reincarnation. The only reason I'm telling you this is so that you will be aware that you're being manipulated by a lot of different people and that you can't allow it to happen. You cannot believe anyone anymore. This is the age of deception. If you don't learn anything else today, I hope you learn that. This is the age of deception. Who's the great deceiver? So you better be careful if you're a Christian. If you're not a Christian, I hope you at least believe in God. But if you don't, you're lost. We're all lost. Without God, there can be no freedom. There can be no creator-endowed rights. 
There can be no protection of those rights. And we are all lost. I don't know about you. I don't want to be lost. It's a terrible state to be in. Coming up through history. These people have always been the ones who have guarded technology, who have guarded knowledge. Why do you think it was that nobody was allowed to read a book in Europe for thousands of years? Do you really think that it would have hurt them if the common man could read books? Not just religion, but everything. They couldn't control man with the hidden knowledge anymore. What upset the balance of power in the world more than anything? The printing press. Why do you think President Bill Clinton calls me the most dangerous radio host in America and is sick the IRS, the BATF, and the FBI on me? Because I didn't believe them when they told me that I was just one lonely little person and there wasn't anything that I could do. I've never believed it. Many of you are sitting here thinking that right now. I'm just one lonely little person and nothing that I can do. This is all terrible news, but what can I can do? And you'll go home and you won't do anything because you convince yourself that you can't. Well, you see, I just never believed that. I just couldn't believe that because you know why? Because I'm a Christian. Now, I'm not trying to insult you or say that if you're not a Christian, that's bad or anything like that. But that enabled me to come out of it because I looked back at what Jesus Christ, one lonely, helpless, solitary human being, did and enabled me to do whatever I want to do. See, he lit the way for me. So I wrote a book called Behold a Pale Horse. Had this big manuscript. Took me years to write it. Nobody will publish it. Well, I had this crazy feeling that if I was doing the right thing, somebody would publish it. Because I just believe that if you're doing the right thing, God will help you. And it's never failed in my life that any time I'm doing the right thing, God always helps me, provides for me. If I'm doing the wrong thing, he smacks me down real quick. So somebody published this. Who published it? The enemy. Light Technology Publishing in Sedona, Arizona. A New Age publisher wanted to publish my book to warn the world about what they were doing to us simply because it had something about UFOs in it and they're really all caught up in that. I started not to put that chapter in there. So the enemy published my book for me. Been stealing all my royalties ever since, but I don't care. Because my goal was not to make money, it was to open people's eyes. I don't care if she steals my money. I really don't. God provides for us, not her. So I published the book. The book made a big hit, I gotta tell you. People were so scared of that book, you couldn't get it in any bookstore in this country. Now, folks, I'm telling you this not to build myself up or make you think I'm anything super, because I'm not. But just to show you that if I'm just one lonely little human being with a family that I must support, just like you, and I have the same brain that you have, if I can do these things, so can you. That's what's important. Not that I did it, but that if I did it, you also can do it. The whole world was stacked against me. And I mean the whole world. You don't know what attack is. I've been attacked physically, mentally. We've been intimidated, followed. We've had weird people show up at our door at 2 o'clock in the morning with purple hair. We've been shot at. 
shit on, and everything else that you can imagine. We've been called every name in the book. I have been attacked by the White House, the FBI, the ATF, the IRS, the Communist News Network, CNN, ABC, CBS, and NBC, all of the major talk radio hosts in America, Rush Limbaugh, and I'm still here. And if I can do it, you can do it. And when all this started, I thought, God, I've got to counter this somewhere. <laughs> and then one day there was a Stanton Friedman character on, uh, on uh, Chuck Harder. And he was just calling me every name in the book. Anti-Semitic, white supremacist, Nazi. And Chuck Harder, yeah, yeah, I know about that guy, Cooper. <laughs> So I called Chuck and I said, hey Chuck, you don't know anything about me. Why do you allow that to happen? And give me 10 minutes on your show just to correct the, the thing. We don't want anybody like you on my show. Oh, anybody like me? But you don't even know me, Chuck. Well, I, I, I know about you. Okay. So I sent him a copy of my book, autographed it to Chuck from Bill. You know, read this. Got a fax from him. I can't repeat what he said in these facts because it might offend some people in here. So I said, okay, I gotta get my own radio show. You can't do that. I can't. Why, why not? You know, radio today is like the road to Galilee. Jesus went along the road to Galilee. He'd find a rock and sit down and start talking. He didn't do what a lot of Christians do today. He didn't go out and try to grab them by the air and force them to learn and tell them if they didn't learn they were going to hell. He just sat on the rock and start talking. And the passers-by, the one to keep going, he let them go, never said a word to them. The ones that stopped, he'd just keep on talking. And pretty soon there'd be this big crowd there and he would teach to them. Well, I found the road to Galilee. It was called a satellite. And I arranged through the Becker Satellite Network to get up on satellite. And I knew that there wasn't a radio station in this world that was going to carry my show. But I was going to be on satellite right there and anybody coming along that wanted to pick it off a of satellite could just do that, you know. And I wouldn't try to force them or make them or anything. And KDNO did it. That's why some of you are here. And a lot of other stations across the country did it. A lot of low power FM stations did it. And a lot of people in this country have satellite dishes and listen to satellite radio that I never even knew about. First two weeks I was on satellite, I knew that nobody was listening to me, and all of a sudden I got hundreds of letters. Whoa! Jesus was right. Find a rock and sit on it and start talking, and somebody's going to stop and listen. He's never steered me wrong, ever, in my whole life. So I had a radio show. Pretty soon, WWCR called me and said, hey, you're hot. We want you on our station five nights a week. I said, I don't have any money. Well, we'll put you on for a reduced rate and we'll see how it goes. We still don't have any money. Sat down with Annie and we decided, well, if God wants us to do this, God will provide the money. And so we signed a contract for a year with no money. And we did it and God provided the money. Everything I've ever needed has been that way. When I was doing a series of videotapes on the Kennedy assassination, I needed Kenny, Kennedy material, didn't know where to get it. I needed speeches. I needed documentaries of his life. We were just driving down the road one day. Remember that, Annie? There was a little thrift store there. And I never go to thrift stores in my life. All of a sudden, I pull into the thrift store and park, and we all get out and walk in. What's right in front of the door? A whole rack full of Kennedy books, materials, records, and tapes. All used, all in various stages of decay and decrepitation, but it's exactly what I needed. And how much did it cost? I bought the whole rack for, I think, like 12 bucks. Now, if you think that happened by accident, you're nuts. I needed it. I was doing the right thing. God provided it for me. And that's the truth. 
And I'm not up here giving you a sermon. I'm telling you about my life. You've got to determine what your life is. We were doing that. And we were finding out that a lot of people read newspapers and were getting the wrong information in newspapers. And people were attacking me in the newspapers and printing lies, just generally lies in the establishment press. So I said, well, we're going to have a newspaper. You can do that. Nobody will carry your newspaper. Nobody will read it. I don't care. I'm going to have a newspaper. So, did a newspaper. Didn't do a tabloid. Didn't do a newsletter. We did a newspaper. You'd be surprised how hard it is to do and how easy it is to do. And because we printed the truth, everybody wanted it. And I mean everybody. And because we wanted the Washington to know that we printed the truth, we sent a free copy to every representative, every senator, every member of the president's cabinet, the president, vice president, and every agency head in Washington. So we'd know. We got you pegged. We're printing the truth. And a lot of people are reading it. Oh, they didn't like that. They still don't like it. Pardon? I don't know. Bill gets one. I don't send her one because she's not an officer in government. <laughs> even though she may think she is. <laughs> this is my hometown paper. It's published by a guy named Glenn Jacobs. He's just one lonely, helpless, broke little guy who happens to have a house full of kids and a wife who, by the way, gives him hell about printing this paper because he doesn't make a lot of money and it takes most of his time. But this is what he does. This is a Round Valley paper. This is where I live. This is our paper. Pass this around and see what's in this paper. You see, there's hope, folks. And you know who's doing these things? One lonely, broke, individual, helpless people with families to support like the rest of you. Who are not doing what most of you are doing, saying, I have a family to support. I'm just one lonely, helpless, broke individual. I don't have any money. <laughs> Don't say that to me. You can do whatever you want to do. And if you're doing the right thing, God will provide for you. I promise you that. It's a promise straight from my heart. I have lived it. I know how it works, and it's the truth. You find out what the right thing to do is. Make sure it's the right thing, and God will provide for you to do it. Now, Annie is the worrier in my family. Whenever we are running out of money or whatever is happening, she begins to worry. And when she worries, I tell you what, she lets me know. <laughs> now what do I tell you, Annie? Trust in God and just do it. And God will provide. And God has always provided. Always. Sometimes it looks hopeless. But it's never hopeless, believe me. When you just think everything's going to collapse, what you need will turn up if, and get me, understand this, folks, if and only if you're doing the right thing. Okay? If you let greed come into it, selfishness, if you're trying to do something to hurt someone else intentionally, God will not provide for you. If your number one goal is money, God's not going to provide for you. He's going to put stumbling blocks in your way. Doesn't mean you can't get rich. You can. Lots of crooks and terrible people in this world have got rich. But you're going to have stumbling blocks. You're going to have a hard, terrible life. And all of those people do, always. They're not happy people. Then we decided to start a radio network and do something nobody else has ever done. Empower the people to take back the airwaves. And they said, guess what? 
you can't do that. <laughs> well, we've done it, and we're still doing it. Now, I'm sort of jumping out of sequence here with this, and I've got to because Rosemary's leaving, and I want to make sure she leaves with this information. I think it's important because she's a leader in the Patriot community and in this community and, and a lot of others. So I'm going to tell you what we're doing, how we're doing it, and how you can be a part of it, and how you can alleviate the burden of expense on you and your community. We decided that one or two radio stations here and there is not enough. It's not enough to educate the American people, to bring them out of the wilderness, so to speak, and into a place of safety because this is the information age. Power is information, not money, today. People who don't understand what's happening are going to be the victims in this war. They're not going to have a choice. So we have to give them that choice by giving them information. We have to educate the American people. We can't do it just by depending upon the good graces of people like Richard Palmquist to run my program and others on his radio station. He did it by the grace of God for a long time without anybody asking him to and I thank him for that and I don't think anybody should hold any animosity toward him because he took it off because he was never required to have it on in the first place. I never asked him to put it on there. He did it because he thought I had a message and he wanted to, to run it. After a while, I guess money became a problem to Richard. He sent me a bill I couldn't pay because we don't have any money. Nothing. Everything we have is put in trust for the children. Right now, between all six of the trusts, I think there's about maybe four thousand dollars total and most of that doesn't belong to us doesn't belong to us subscriptions people have paid to purchase Veritas and and other things it's committed okay but it is important you have your assets in trust Annie and I own nothing have nothing don't want anything Everything is in trust for our children and for the nation. We have a charitable trust, which is the Independence Foundation Trust, which everything that is not used in the other trusts goes as a donation to the Independence Foundation Trust, which gives back to the nation that which it holds. Okay? Here's what we're doing. We put together what we call the Worldwide Freedom Radio Network. WWFN for short. Worldwide Freedom Network. <clears throat> we have purchased a satellite transponder for 24 hours a day. Do you know how much that costs? <laughs> Do you have any idea what that costs? Pardon? One thousand a day. One thousand a what? A day. a day. That's close. That's very close. We don't have the money. I just told you how much money we have. <laughs> we purchased this for a year. Because we know that if we're doing the right thing, God will provide that money. God never fails to do it if we're doing the right thing. So we have the satellite transponder. It's satellite GE-1, the most powerful satellite in the sky. Transponder 7, write this down folks. Satellite GE-1, transponder 7. 7.56 is the audio frequency. Wide band. So it's GE-1, transponder 7, 7.56 wide band. We're up there with scheduled programming. We can't put 24 hour a day programming up there yet because we don't have the money for the telephone uplink to the transponder, to the satellite uplink to the transponder 
for a 24 hour day period, it costs us 10 bucks an hour to do that. Okay? So the listening audience so far is making donations and providing in donations $10 here, $5 there, $50. I think there's been a couple of $100 donations in order for us to put additional programming up on the satellite. The programming up that's up there is paid programming. Any of you in here who have ever dreamed of having your radio, own radio show can now realize that dream. We only have one rule. You don't say anything on our network unless you can document it. If you can't document it, you don't say it. If you make a habit of saying things you can't document, we just take you off the network. Other than that, you're welcome to broadcast on our network. We don't even have to agree with what you say as long as it's true and you can document it. Okay? For you to have your own radio station, our own radio show, I should say, on our network costs you $30 an hour. That's the lowest rate in the industry in the world, not just in this country, in the world. It is not only the lowest rate, but it undercuts the lowest rate by so much it would amaze you. The next lowest rate is $65 an hour on Jeff Baker's Amerinet. Okay? It's $30 an hour if you want to have a show on our network. You can have one show a week, one show a month. Five shows a week, I don't care. If you have five shows a week on our network, it's a flat rate, $600 per month. Where does that money go? Where's the money go? Goes to pay for the satellite. Not one red cent of it goes in my pocket or anybody else's. Period. Okay, we're up there. Who's going to hear us? Anybody got any ideas? <laughs> no. We have created a network of affiliate radio stations made up of you. Micro broadcasting on FM bands. Okay? We now have over 700 affiliates. Over 700 affiliates. Some of them outside this country in foreign countries. Some of them in Canada. Some of them in Mexico. Okay. Now, so we have a big listenership already. Plus, I'm on shortwave. My show is on shortwave. 99.55 kilohertz. It's WRMI out of uh, Miami. Worldwide. Uh, Pardon? What time? Five until seven Eastern Daylight Time, Monday through Friday. Now let me tell you about these micro broadcasters. This is the most incredible thing I ever saw because there have always been people who call themselves pirate radio stations. That's not what we are. We're not pirate radio stations. We're not breaking the law. We don't want to break the law. We've discovered that most people don't know the law about broadcasting, and anybody in this room can own your own radio station tomorrow if you want it. Today, if there was a place across the street where you could buy the equipment. Okay? And I'm going to tell you how to do this, because I want you to do it. Somebody in this room, right here today, within a couple of months, is going to have their own radio station on the air, right here. Maybe several of you. And I don't care if you carry our programming or not. What I care about is that you provide your community with an alternate source of news and programming. That's important. Because the communists and the socialists have taken over all of the media in this country and nobody's hearing the truth. You had a voice here. It's gone. Whoever the new owners are, I guarantee you, aren't going to be like Richard Palmquist. Some of these stations are so small that they only transmit a couple of blocks from the transmitter. How many houses are in a couple of blocks? Quite a few people live there, huh? So even though they're not transmitting to a whole city, 
If they're transmitting a couple of blocks in every direction, they're hitting a lot of people. And if they provide programming on a regularly scheduled basis, those people can always know that they can tune in at 6 o'clock and hear this program. Right? That's what's important. You can't just decide, well, we're going to broadcast two hours tonight, and, and then we're going to be off the air till Friday, and then Friday morning we're going to broadcast an hour, and then on Sunday we're going to broadcast six hours. Because if people don't know that you're always going to be on the air at these certain times, they're just simply not going to tune in anymore. So you have to provide continuity. Okay? Some of these micro-broadcasting stations are broadcasting out to a quarter of a mile in every direction from the transmitter. Some of them are going out five or six miles in every direction, hitting a lot of people. Some of them are going out 10, 15 miles in every direction. We have one of our affiliates made the Arbitron ratings recently. We have four stations that are broadcasting with 90, 95 watts of power, which is powerful. We have one that just went to 120 watts. Yes? I'm, I'm going to cover that. But right now, I want, to, want you to know the potential. When you hit 100 watts, you're on your own. Because that's when you've come into the purview of the FCC, but only under certain circumstances. Okay? Here's what we discovered by studying the law. The FCC virtually has no authority, period, except to license broadcasters who are engaged in interstate commerce, period. They do not have the authority to punish, fine, seize equipment, try, prosecute, or anything else, anybody even the people they license. They can recommend those things to other agencies, but they don't have the authority to do any of the things that they have been doing. If they come to you and issue you an apparent violation notice, or a notice of apparent violation, and say that you have been fined $10,000, that's unlawful. They have broken the law. They have no authority to do that whatsoever. And you have been denied due process. No charges have been brought against you. You have not been tried. You have not been convicted of anything, have you? When confronted with someone who knows the law, these people run like hell. It's happening all over the country. You would be amazed at how quickly this is growing into a groundswell of grassroots broadcasting. And who started it? One lonely, broke, helpless individual with a family to support who didn't have the money. I got on WWDCR and said, this is what we're going to do. You guys are all going to go out and buy these little broadcasting transmitters, and we're going to start this. And we did. And it's a success. How many of you, are there anybody in here listening uh, that listens on one of our FM affiliates? Anybody in here from any place? Okay, this is unusual. Usually there's at least one or two. We're on the air between 5 and 7 p.m. My show. We have other shows. 5 and 7 p.m. Eastern Daylight. There may be a low-power broadcaster in this area who's carrying our programming. I don't know. Go through your FM band slowly during that time. If you hear my voice, you've got a station near you. If you don't, you need to make a station near you so that everybody can hear. Either me or somebody else or your own programming. You could just play music for 24 hours a day. It's up to you. Here's how you can do it, folks. For less than $1,000, you can have your own radio station. And when I say less than $1,000, I'm not exaggerating in any way, shape, or form. It's the truth. And if you all get together 
and share that cost. You can have a community-owned radio station that you all donate time to and help run for 25 or 50 bucks a piece. Okay? You must be less than 100 watts to be safe. You can be over 100 watts if you're not broadcasting interstate or across any international boundary and you're not engaged in commerce, which means no commercials. Okay? If you're going to have commercials or go across a boundary, you better not have 100 watts and you better not have commerce. Okay? So you got to be less than 100 watts, no commerce, and it's got to be intrastate. What's intrastate mean? Within your state. Within your state. Your broadcast cannot go across a state line or an international boundary and should not be able to be received by ships at sea. Okay? If you stick within those parameters, the FCC has absolutely no authority, no jurisdiction over you whatsoever. We wrote a letter to the FCC folks. Said, please, tell us about your regulation of intrastate broadcasting on the FM band. Guess what we got back? The FCC does not regulate intrastate broadcasting. The FCC regulates interstate commerce amongst broadcasters over 100 watts of power. I've read the letter on the air several times. We've also prepared a great legal dossier from all of the confrontations with the FCC across the country. And guess what? The FCC is leaving all of us alone. Because we're not violating the law. We're within the law. We're doing the right thing, and we know what we're doing, and we can quote the law to them. And they don't want to see us in court. Recently, the FCC tried to intimidate one of our 95 watt broadcasters. He wasn't intimidated. Neither were we. The FCC said, well, in that case, we'll help you get a license. <laughs> so that you can broadcast with even more power. So the FCC is helping that station get a license. How about that? I have a station in Eager, Arizona, 101.1 FM. 101.1 FM, Eager. Classic radio, like you always wished it could be. And it's not usually your voice that does that, though. Yes, it is. It's, it's a little girl that does it a lot of times. That's the little girl that does it most of the time. <laughs> but occasionally I do it too. We started off with we started off <laughs> we started off with 25 milliwatts of power. with 25 milliwatts of power on the mountain where we live, surrounded by 7,000 people, we were going out six miles. We added a little one watt amplifier to it, now we're going 15 miles in every direction. We own the valley. There's a commercial station there nobody listens to anymore. They don't listen to them anymore. Everybody in the valley is listening to 101.1 FM Eager. When we're not carrying regular programming 
from the Worldwide Freedom Radio Network on my station, I play oldies all the time. And you can listen to my station for 24 hours and never hear the same song repeated twice. Can you, have you ever heard any music station in the country where you can say that? No. No. So that's one of the reasons they listen to 101.1 FM, besides the wonderful programming that we give them when we're giving them programming. Yes, Rosemary. Can they shut off the satellite? Yes, they can. <laughs> I, I know that probably as good as they have done that to me. When I have really been hitting them with some hard programming that they just don't want the American people to hear, they have turned off that transponder just as cold as, as if you stepped into an ice water shower. And there's nothing you can do about it. But they don't do it all the time. And they don't do it that often because they don't want anybody to know that they can do it. So, as frequently as they do it, they only do it when I'm really into something that, that's really dangerous to them. And they can always say that it was some technical glitch or something. Yes? Pardon? Oh, wow, there's all kinds of satellites up there all over the sky, folks. And there are people who do nothing but make their living brokering transponders on satellites. They sell satellite time. So you have to, uh, the, way I, the way we found out is just by word of mouth, I wanted to get on the radio. I didn't know how to do it. And somebody said, well, call this guy Becker in Kansas. I called him. That was the first satellite I ever was on. After that, they've been calling me for years. You want to buy some satellite time on blah, 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 blah? You want to be on the Inspiration Channel? Uh, we, we would sure like to have you on the Outdoor Channel. How much is it? $600 an hour. No, thank you. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> but God always provides. Okay, now you're going to be amazed at how cheaply you can do this. Now, if you don't think these, these prices are cheap, you go down to your local satellite dealer and ask them what their prices are. Cheapest price they can give you, okay? Here's what we can give you. We can give you an eight foot, excuse me, it's a seven foot, isn't it, Annie? Seven foot Orbitron dish, which is the best there is. We can give you a seven foot Orbitron dish. We can give you the cables. We can give you the satellite receiver. Now this receives audio and television. Now you can just forget about all this, purchase our satellite system and Destroy your mind with TV if you want to. <laughs> it's up to you. You can get everything from us to set up your satellite dish and receive any satellite you want, but we want you to get our programming and rebroadcast it, or rebroadcast whatever you want from anywhere you want. Amerinet's up there. I think the Freedom Radio Network's up there. Uh, you don't even have to get a satellite receiving station if you don't want to. You can just set up your own radio broadcasting station and you can be the announcer, talk show host, uh, religious preacher, anything you want to be on radio on your own station or you can buy tapes from other people and play them. Pardon? I don't know. I really don't. Okay, so now we can sell you a complete satellite receiving station for I believe it's, what is it Annie? $580, something like that? No, it's more than that. I think it's 500, between $565 and $580. But you can write us at that address and we'll send you the, the exact price. Okay? Because I didn't come here to sell you this stuff. I came here to let you know that it's available. I'm also letting you know that you can get fantastic deals from people who already have satellite receiving stations, the dish, the receiver, everything, who have gone to this little bitty dish and want to get rid of their old one. Sometimes you can pick up the whole system for 150 bucks. 
You see, I'm not trying to sell you ours. I'm just telling you, we have made arrangements with a manufacturer to give you the best brand new system that money can buy, cheaper than you can buy at any place else in the country. But you have other opportunities open to you. What I really want you to do is get one from somewhere I don't care where. If you don't get it from us, it won't hurt me. But if you get one, no matter where you get it from, it will make me very happy. Because it opens your horizons. It expands your horizons. You're not locked in to just the stations here. Or just the radio here. Every radio program in the world is on satellite. You didn't know that, did you? Rush Limbaugh's up there. Everybody. That's how radio stations get their radio transmissions now, off a of satellite. Every television program you ever dreamed of is on satellite. It's all up there. Okay? If you think cable's great, you ain't seen nothing. We sit on our mountaintop with our little remote control. We can get anything in the world, including the feeds that you never saw yet and never will see because they're cut out on the cutting room floor. We watch the whole Waco thing on KU Band, the stuff you never saw. Everything, it's all up there. The Gulf War, 24 hours a day. The Gulf War was on satellite, but you only saw 10 seconds on the Dan Rather report. Yes, Gary. Two questions. Uh, the definition of no commerce, and then the other one is, can you rebroadcast music? Is there a problem with the BMI or ASCAP? No. If you use it as your theme song, and you haven't paid the author or don't have the permission of the author, yeah, you're in, you, could, you could get in trouble, maybe. Well, not only that, but you see, if you're playing music and it's different music all the time, you're just another DJ, only you don't have commercials in between. You're selling their music for them. Commerce is when you're trading in goods. You offer something for sale. Are you charged for programming? Okay. Worldwide Freedom Radio Network charges for programming. 101.1 FM Eager doesn't. FCC has no jurisdiction over me renting a satellite transponder and putting up there whatever I want to. I can charge whatever I want to for it. But 101.1 FM Eager does not charge for programming, nor does it pay for programming, nor does it have commercials. It is a community service station, nonprofit. Big loser, if you want to know the truth, because everything is donated and everything is a cost. Nothing, is, nothing comes in. Yes? No, you can't, you can't offer anything for sale as the radio station. You can carry network programming that has commercials. That's not a station commercial. You're just rebroadcasting somebody else's programming. They can't get you for that. And they can't get you anyway, Gary, unless it goes across a state line. How about a body of water? Like a lake or a pond? Lake or a pond, no. Great lakes, where there may be Canadian shipping, yes. Pacific Ocean, yep. Atlantic Ocean, yep. Gulf of Mexico, yep. Lake, pond, no. International or interstate border? Yes. See, you can even engage in commerce as long as you are intrastate. You understand what I'm saying? You can't get in trouble with commerce unless you're going across a state or international boundary or a large body of water such as an ocean or the Great Lakes. The FCC is only authorized to regulate interstate commerce, period. They are not authorized to regulate anything intrastate, and that goes for most or all agencies of government. 
Now your state can regulate this, but so far we have not found one state who regulates radio broadcast one way. And the people to check with is your state utility commission. I can tell you right now, the state of California does not regulate one way FM radio broadcast, period. Yes? No. Not yet. Yes, Rosemary. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. You mean... It's one-way broadcast. For instance, it's not walkie-talkies. You don't have a transmitter and a receiver to which we are talking back and forth of. It's a broadcast from a central point out and nobody answers back. That's what that means. She meant for your own telephone, I believe. You know, could they call you up? Absolutely, yeah. Sure they can call you up. Can you ask for donations? Yeah. Let me say this once again. As long as you are broadcasting intrastate, you can pretty much do whatever you want to do. I would not recommend exceeding 100 watts. If you go across a state boundary, now you're getting into some touchy territory. You can cross a state boundary if you're not engaged in commerce. Because the FCC only has jurisdiction only over interstate commerce. Period. 100 watts and above. But just to be safe, I don't want you to go across state lines. I would prefer that you stay away from commerce. And I would prefer that you stay below 100 watts. Don't tickle the tail of the dragon if you want this to succeed. See, our goal is not to piss off the FCC. Our goal is to educate the American people. Keep your eye on the sparrow. Okay, that's our goal. Yes, sir. The FCC also regulates the assigned frequencies. You've got to use a band that doesn't have an assigned frequency. Well, they can only assign frequencies to those that they license, and those that they license, they can only license that are engaged in 100 watts or over and interstate commerce. You can use any frequency that you want, whether it's assigned or not, as long as it's not assigned in your area. For instance, all FM frequencies are assigned somewhere. Okay? I use 101.1 FM in Eager because there's nobody broadcasting on 101.1 FM Eager or within 50 miles. You can't hear anybody on that frequency at any time ever. And I studied that frequency for a month before I decided to use it and a lot of others. And that's what you've got to do too. For instance, in Los Angeles area, it would be hard to find a frequency that you could broadcast on. Be very difficult. Because I guarantee you, there's something on almost every FM band in Los Angeles. But here in Delano, you can study all the available frequencies several times a day and during the night, and you could drive out and make trips all around studying the reception on these frequencies for about 30 days, and you can come up with a frequency that's clear that you can broadcast on that's not going to interfere with or hurt anybody else. And you don't want to do that. You don't want to interfere with somebody else's broadcast. That's not what we're about. We're about freedom, right? That's right. You don't want to broadcast on a frequency where somebody else is already broadcasting. Why would you want to do that? Yeah. Sure. What you want to do is do what I did. You want to find, like in our area, there's a 96.5 and there's a 101.7. Excuse me. It's 101.7. That's right. 96.5 101.7. So people driving through that area or listening to radio will go back and forth between them. And most radios have that automatic button. 
You punch the button and then it'll go to the next broadcasting station. I captured a huge audience who thought they were going from 96.5 to 101.7 and it locked on my frequency. And before they understood that they weren't on 101.7, they were hooked on my music <laughs> and programming. So there was a method to my madness. And you also want to stay at the higher end of the FM spectrum because at the lower end there's a lot of, of uh, what are they, public broadcasting stations um, on, on the lower end of FM. And they're all over the country. And a lot of people listen to them. Okay? There's also such a thing as harmonics, so you want to make sure you have a good transmitter. Now, I've already told you what you can get the satellite receiving system for. Let me give you some prices for transmitters. <laughs> this is going to frost you. I'm going to give you the price for my transmitter, the one I have. It's the only one I recommend anymore. Not because I have it, but because we have recommended others because they were cheaper and it just doesn't work out. Okay? This one, if you put it together yourself, is $249.95. It's a kit. 25 milliwatts. Okay? This is a kit. This is a professional radio station. It's about this big. It has all the filters, everything in it. It sounds as good or better than any commercial FM station you've ever listened to in your life. When people come up to my studio and they say, where's the radio station? And I say, right there, and I point to this little box. <laughs> You're kidding. Man, it sounds good. And it does. You can tune into any FM station you want to anywhere. This sounds as good or better. And I'm not joking, I'm not lying to you, I'm telling you the truth, it really does. It costs $249.95, that's if you put it together yourself. There's an export version kit, which you also put together yourself, costs $329.95, instead of 25 milliwatts, it's one watt. But you have to send a letter telling them that you're going to export the radio. Okay? So you know what people do? They phone their friend in Arkansas. Say, I'm going to send you the money. I want you to order this from Ramsey. Send them a letter saying you're going to export this radio. When they get it, they send it to you. It's been exported from Arkansas to California. You told the truth. There's also one. It's the high power export version fully wired and tested, assembled. It's $399.95. Again, you have to send them a letter saying you're going to export that transmitter. Okay? Or they won't sell it to you. Pardon? They're just covering themselves in case the FCC gets antsy. They don't want to be blamed for selling you a radio that you might use to try to broadcast over a commercial station frequency. Uh, and, and interfere with somebody else and get in all kinds of legal tangles. That's why. It's called CYA. Yeah. Are these set up to uh, just uh, hook a linear two or an amplifier two? Or, or you can hook whatever you want to. These are these are the basic unit that you can go ahead and amplify. Them. No, this isn't a basic unit. This is a really professional transmitter. Well, what I mean is, it's only putting out one watt or whatever. Can you go ahead and run a linear to that? You can run it into uh, an amplifier, okay. but you have to make sure that it's built for FM right. transmissions. You can't, I don't believe that you could hook this to like a CB linear oh, no, amp. No, 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 no. Okay. Is, yeah. Okay, the antenna. They make an antenna that is built especially for this transmitter. It's called the True Match FM broadcast antenna. By the way, this is Ramsey. You can call them and get their catalog. Let me give you their number. It's 800-446-2295. 800-446-2295. Ask them to send you a catalog. 
Remember, the only transmitter that I recommend is the Super Pro FM stereo radio station. That's the only one I'll recommend to you. We've tried the FM10, we've tried the FM25. If you have a super wizard that can put those together and not uh, make any cold solder joints or anything like that, um, they'll work fine. But we're finding out that a lot of people aren't able to do that. Okay? So, what we recommend is a super pro FM stereo radio station. I don't get a penny from Ramsey. They don't even know that I'm doing this. I'm sure they'd be happy if they did know. You can either get the kit and put it together yourself. You've got to be good to do these kits. You can't do any cold solders and you can't screw up the parts, okay? If you can't do that, find somebody who can. If you can't find somebody, call us and we'll give you the name and address of somebody who will do it for you for a fee and they do it really good. Or you can order the fully wired and tested export version for $399.95. You don't have to assemble anything. It's been done by professionals at the factory. It's fully guaranteed. All you have to do is write a letter saying it's going to be exported. Now don't lie to them. If you write a letter to them saying it's going to be exported, export it. You understand what I'm saying? You don't have to tell them where you're exporting it to, but export means it's going to cross a line somewhere. Okay? Tell the truth, export it, because I will not be a party to lies. I just won't be. Do they have a website? No. True Match FM Broadcast Antenna. This is a kit also. It's easy to put together. I did mine in about an hour. It is fantastic. It is really great. Cost you $39.95. It's matched to the transmitter. Now, if you want a one watt amp, which will give you more power, here's what I recommend that you do. First, you go to Radio Shack. Radio Shack has a little unit that costs you ten dollars, or excuse me, twelve dollars and ninety-five cents. It's one of those things you hook up when you're running like over a hundred feet of cable between your VCR and your television set. Get the one that's 10 decibels. Now they have a 10 decibel, they have a 20 decibel, and they have a 30 decibel. Get the 10 decibel. You get the 20 decibel and the 30 decibel, you're going to screw up. Believe me. I've already tried it. I made the mistakes. I ruined some equipment. Learn from me. <laughs> get the 10 decibel inline amplifier, which means it has one cable going in, one cable coming out. There's nothing else on there. It's not a splitter. And it's built for amplifying FM, stereo, and television through cable over 100 feet. Okay? You run your antenna cable from your transmitter to this unit, and then a short line from this unit to a 1 watt amplifier, which I'm going to give you right now, 1 watt amplifier, Wired, tested, and in a case, $99.99. See, when I told you it's under $1,000, I wasn't joking you. <laughs> $99.99 for a 1-watt linear power booster wired, tested, in a case. And that's the LPA 1-watt. Now, when you get that, you also have to get the 12-volt DC wall plug adapter, which is the AC 12-5 for $9.95. That's it. You mount your antenna where you want it to be, the higher the better. You run your cable down to your one watt amplifier, everything else is in line. You hook up your mixer and your CD player or your tape player and your microphone and all that kind of stuff that you're going to use to broadcast with, and you're on the air. Now I'm not counting anything else because everybody's got that already anyway. Everybody's got a cassette deck, don't you? If you don't, they're really inexpensive. CD players today are inexpensive. You can go to Radio Shack and get a little bitty mixer, 30, 40 bucks. That's it. You're on the air. You're on the air. If you have the satellite receiving station, you can get our schedule. And when we have scheduled broadcasting on satellite, all you gotta do is turn on your satellite and plug it into your mixer, and uh, we're on the air. 
when we don't have scheduled broadcasting, you can put whatever you want to. But understand this, if you're going to have a radio station, have a radio station. If people can't count on tuning to that frequency and hearing something, they will soon not tune to that frequency. You gotta have something there. How do you do that? How do you play music 24 hours a day? Well, you get a 24 disc CD changer and 24 CDs and you put them in there and you turn it on. You adjust your volume levels and you walk away and that thing will play music for 24 hours and you don't have to do anything. Everybody on town, well, who's watching the studio? God watches my studio, <laughs> 24 hours a day. So there you have it. What happens if you have power outages? What happens if you have an earthquake? What happens if a volcano erupts? <laughs> I mean, you can be as elaborate as you want to. If you want to, you can hook up a, an automatic starting secondary generator that will turn itself on when the power trips off. And uh, you can have a, a backup, uh, what do they call it, a UPS, like computer guys do, to make up for that interval while the generator's starting. And you can never have interrupted anything. I mean, it, you, you can get as elaborate as you want to. I just gave you simple basics. You can do what you want to do. You can even get people from the community to come in and write, produce, and put on original radio drama. You can do whatever you want to do. You can be a real radio station right here in Porterville, California, or Atlanta, Georgia, or wherever you want to be. Texas. Somebody, people here from Austin, Texas. Okay. So within a month or two, I expect to have some of you people on the air. You should call my secretary at this number, 520-333-4578. It's 520-333-4578. If you're going to do this, we'll send you our package for being an affiliate station, including all the legal briefs and a whole bunch of other stuff and our schedule of programming and uh, help you in any way that we can. Three 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 four five seven eight, area code five two zero. Yes, ma'am. There is one uh, already operating just north of here in Ivanhoe. Any guys? Yes, you're right. We do have an affiliate in Ivanhoe. Yes, we do. So you've heard that station. Well, I know him, so I remember. Okay, yeah, yeah, we do have an affiliate station just north of here, not very far. Town Golf Junior. That's right. It's, the, it's 100 point. I can get it if you want to call me. I forgot. What <coughs> Okay, does anybody have any questions about low power broadcasting, Worldwide Freedom Radio Network, any of this that we've just discussed? I want to get that out of the way because I don't want it to interfere with what we're going to be doing later. Yes, sir? Pardon? That's the best place to broadcast from. The higher your antenna is, the farther your, your broadcast will go and the less power you have to have to do it. So the higher you can get your antenna, can you do it with batteries? yes, with these you can. In fact, if you get a, a, an AC-DC converter, you could drive up to the top of a mountain in your car and broadcast, set the antenna up on top of your, your, uh, your car and, uh, and broadcast from right there. Yeah, you can. Do you know if there's any height limits on the antenna from the ground, from where you're at? In other words, can you be over 50 feet? Can you be over 100 feet? I don't know. You have to talk to the people in your area. Yes, Gary. There's limits on certain I guess the instructions on the antenna tie out of ground it so you don't let it do yourself. Well, I can't tell them everything. <laughs> There's some things you're going to have to learn, folks, in doing this. And, and most of it comes in the directions with the kits and things. Uh, but you should, you know, do a little bit more than, than just a cursory look at this. Because you do need to ground your antenna. You do need to take precaution against lightning. You do need to make sure that when you put your antenna up, it's not near any power lines. Okay? 
A lot of people have been killed trying to hoist up an antenna mast and it gets out of their grip and falls against a power line and you got crispy critters all over the lawn. And it doesn't make your wife very happy. Okay? Any other questions? Yes, sir. Well, you, you have to go out and find out. Like every once in a while, just to make sure everything's operating correctly, I'll get in my Bronco and I'll drive all around the valley and I'll drive out in every direction as far as I can go and make sure that we're still operating at peak capacity. And that's how you find out, by going out and listening to your own station. And when you drive and it starts getting weak and then you can't hear it anymore, that's the limits of your broadcasting range as far as anybody can hear it, as far as the affecting broadcast, effective broadcast range is where you can hear it and understand it and it's pleasing to the ear. Okay? What if you live within a fairly large state, you Not if you're under 100 watts, no. Not unless you're near the border. I don't know any radio station that even broadcasts at 100 watts that, that, that can go 100 miles. You usually can't hear them more than 40 miles. See, 100 watts, when radio is concerned, is not a lot of power. KDNO broadcasts with what? 50,000. 50,000 watts. So we're talking 100 watts here. Less than 100 watts. You know, with 95 watts, you're going to go maybe 20, 25 miles. If you're on a mountaintop with one watt, you can go 15. Just depends upon how high you can get your antenna. Okay? I think that is important. That you all know that and that you can do it. And that you not be afraid to do it. I'm going to give you my website now. Write this down. If you want to learn more about this, it's all on my website on the internet, and it gives you links to go to other places so you can learn other things. It's, get ready for this, it's the big www. HTTP <laughs> colon www, no, it's HTTP colon, forward slash, forward slash, I almost forgot that, yeah. www dot telepath dot com forward slash believer HTTP colon forward slash forward slash www dot telepath dot com forward slash believer. Yeah, everything on the internet is small letters. Yes, sir. Uh, Ramsey also has a website. It's on the front of your cover of the magazine. Do they? No. Yes, sir. It's right on the front page and down towards the bottom. Front page. No. It's not on yours? No. Line at home. If it was on mine, I would have given it to you. I've got it at home. Evidently, they haven't sent me the new catalog yet. Okay. If there are no further questions on this, let's take a, a short break and then we'll come back and get into some more meat of the matter. <laughs> I am routinely attacked by white supremacists, real white supremacists, because I won't support their racist viewpoint. And because I won't support their racist viewpoint, I get letters like, I forget what they call them, your children are, uh, pardon? Mo uh, mongrels, that's right, your children are mongrels. And when we take over the nation, we're going to have to, we're going to kill all the mongrels. And uh, you're a race traitor because you married a Chinese woman. All this kind of stuff. 
And then I get attacked from the other side saying that I'm a white supremacist. Okay, so when you enter this battle, I hope you understand that nobody's going to like you. Because in this day and age, if you stand for freedom, nobody likes you. Now I'm going to talk about the militia. How many of you in here are in the militia? I am. I'm not afraid to admit it. Okay. I'm going to talk about the militia. If you're not in the militia, you need to be. If you are in the militia, you need to reorganize your thinking because I guarantee you, you've got the wrong concept of what the militia is and you're probably operating illegally, unlawfully, unethically, and probably maybe even immorally. <clears throat> and I say that based upon past experience with other militias around the country not knowing anything about your militia and with the added CYA thing that uh, I could have been wrong about that. But most probably I'm right. Now, <clears throat> what's wrong with a militia? Nothing, that's right. What is the militia? Who said that? Okay, say it again, real loud. That's correct. That was the concept and the founding of this nation was that the people would act as their own defense. That there would never be a standing army. Why? Because they saw what standing armies could do to a civilian population to enslave them and destroy them in Europe. And they wanted to start what? A new world. They want to get rid of all of that stuff. So they gave us freedom. It's a great gift. They knew we would probably throw it away, but they wanted to give us all the tools to make sure that we could keep it if we really deserved it, and if we did, and we could hang on to it responsibly and not give it away in exchange for some imagined security or benefits from a big central government or a king or something like that, then that would be the New World Order. That would be the New World. Okay? So a lot of people think that when I tell them what our founding fathers really were, that I'm attacking them, and that, that if they really were that, they wouldn't have given us freedom and all this kind of stuff. Baloney. They understood human nature. They gave us our freedom, knowing that human nature is to give it up in exchange for a promised security, even if it means we have to go into slavery. Because they understood what it took me a long time to figure out, because I really didn't understand all this in the beginning either. And usually I, I find the true answer by just looking within myself. Don't we usually spend the first 20 years of our life trying to get away from home and become free and responsible? Doesn't everybody, their big dream is, gee, I'll be glad when I'm out of daddy's house and and I can go where I want to, and I don't have to be in by midnight, and I can drive my car, and you know. Isn't that true? How many of you think that's true? Good. And isn't it also true that once we get out there and understand what's really required and how responsible we are and how hard it is, that we spend the rest of our life trying to find somebody that'll take care of us? Huh? Isn't that true? Not anymore. Good. Isn't that why a lot of guys go in the military? Oh, I'm leaving home and it's a hard world out there. <laughs> no, never, I'm going into service. They'll give me a bed and food and all that kind of stuff and send me around the world and I get to see everybody, have a girl at every port and boy, I'm just fine, huh? And then you find out what that is. The socialism. And some guys love it and they stay in for life. Some of them even convince themselves that they're doing great service for their country, which is what I was involved in, convincing myself that I was doing great service for my country. It was my plan to stay in the military forever until I figured it all out and saw what was really going on when they made a mistake and put me in the Office of Naval Intelligence and I became the briefing team member for Admiral Bernard Clary and got to see the truth, I said, oh, I'm leaving. 
and I was gone. That's why you can't depend upon these guys sitting around the VFW and the veterans of foreign wars and the American Legion halls to help us in this battle. They spent their life in the military. They are socialists. All they give a damn about, and, I'm, and I don't care if it pisses you off if you're one of them, because it's the truth, and I'll stand and duke it out with you face to face over it if you want to. It's the truth. The only thing they give a damn about is sitting around in those halls, getting drunk and telling lies about how brave they are and getting their retirement check every month. They have been trained to be socialists and they are going to be good little socialists forever. Okay? It's the truth. Absolute truth. Anybody who's receiving a government check is not going to help us in this battle. That includes old folks on Medicare and everything else. If you can't turn around and walk away from it now, you're not going to help us in this battle. You have been socialized. Sorry if it makes you angry, but it's true, because you're not going to do anything to jeopardize your little checky-wecky, right? But the truth is, free people don't get little checky-weckies from Big Brother. They don't do it. And Social Security is not an insurance policy. It's a hook. It's a hook, along with all the rest of these benefits and things. You cannot accept the benefit from Big Brother without enslaving yourself in the process. Okay? Now, I know I've just really severely made some of you angry. But I promised you I would do that when I came in, and I never, ever go back on my promise. <laughs> So I want you to think about that. For some of you, it may be too late. If you're up into your elder years and you haven't done anything in your life to save any money to provide for your old age or your retirement or your medical expenses because you were promised Social Security, didn't think you had to, then maybe you don't have any way out of that. And I don't have any answers for you. And I truly feel for you in my heart because you're engaged in a conflict within yourself. But most of you in here aren't in that situation. And there are things that you can do to provide for your old age and your medical care and, and anything else that you're going to need as life progresses upon us all and nobody leaves this place alive and nobody ever stays young forever. Okay? Why do you think it is that over the years they have encouraged people to put the elderly in the old folks' homes? Hmm? It's to take the wisdom of many, many years of experience and living and learning out of the home and to hook the elderly in a social system which they can't give up. You want to help your old folks get out of it? Take them back into your house. Get them out of the old folks home. Take them off of social security and all that other stuff. Take care of them like you're supposed to. Like they took care of you and changed your shitty little diapers when you were little children. Now they did that for all of us. How dare we? How dare we? Put them on a shelf waiting to die in an old folks home. To me, that's criminal. It is one of the things that's destroying this country. It takes grandmothers and grandfathers away from little children. It deprives them of the ability to see someone die in the home and be able to understand it and know that someday it's going to happen to them too. Now, if you have children, understand that under the current system, someday your children are going to turn their back on you and shelve you in an old folks home so you can die out of their sight, out of their mind, and out of their pocketbook. And if you don't think that's going to happen, you don't think your own children will do that to you, you better take another look around. Because that's the norm today. It's a terrible thing. It will not happen to my parents. When they get too old, they can't take care of themselves. I will go and get them and bring them home and take care of them. 
and Annie's parents too, if I have to go to China to do it. That's not a boast, it's a fact in my family. And it should be in yours. If it's not, you need to do something to rectify it. There are a lot of things that are occurring in this country that are wrong that need to be righted and we can do it. And you don't have to wait for anybody else to be able to do that. You can provide for your own. You can take care of yourselves. Now I'm going to tell you something else. In this country, it has become a disgrace not to have a lot of money. Why do you think they do that? Why do you think that that's being foisted upon us? To get you in debt under their control and make you a victim. When I was a young boy, we didn't have a lot of money. We didn't have much of anything. But I'll tell you something, we were happy. We had each other. And it was before television seized the minds of America. And we talked to each other. And people would come over in the evening and sit around and actually talk to each other. Do you realize how rare that is today? Do you understand that the average American spends seven hours a day in front of the television set? That's on top of work and eating and sleeping. People don't know each other. They don't talk to each other. They don't know their neighbors. They don't know their own family members. These are all things we can do something about. What I advise people to do as far as the television set is concerned, find the youngest child in your family, give them a hammer, and tell them to go play with the set. <laughs> do your child a favor, though. Unplug it first. Let them play with it. See, little Johnny, the television set is broken. Here's a hammer and a screwdriver. Would you please go fix it for Daddy? <laughs> That child will take care of the biggest problem you've got in your home in short shrift, I guarantee you. And at first it'll seem a little strange. But after you actually get used to talking to each other, you're going to find a miracle is going to take place. You're going to become a family again. You're going to know each other. You're going to do things with each other. You're going to care about each other. You're going to talk about your problems. You're actually going to invite the neighbors over and if they can break away from their TV set, they might even come. And if they come and find that there's no TV set in your living room, they'll be forced to talk to you. And you'll find another miracle will occur. You'll become friends. Now that's really weird, isn't it? But when I was a kid, that was normal. All the children in the block would be outside playing all in the street and till late at night. And nobody was ever afraid. Nobody ever got molested or kidnapped or hurt or run over or anything else. We'd play kick the can and run around with the flashlights and, and just have a great time. And the adults would be in talking and playing music and having snacks and sometimes a drink or two. And I got to tell you, I remember it as a really great time. What I see now is not great. Nobody knows anybody. And as soon as people come home, they plant themselves in front of the TV set and they don't leave that TV set until they go to bed. And nobody talks to anybody. And everybody's afraid of everybody else because that's all you see on TV is everybody killing everybody else, right? It is absolutely true that what children and people, adults see on TV will make inroads into their lives. It will desensitize you to accept things that you never would have accepted before because you are bombarded with it on television 24 hours a day. And so it becomes a normal part of your life. And so when it happens in your neighborhood, it doesn't bother you. And that's one of the main purposes of all of this. We've got to pause for about 30 seconds while they change the tape.